Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center. Nice to see you. I forgot my pointer tonight. So that's going to take some of my anointing off. I got to use the old clicker. It barely works. All right. Welcome to Phoenix. And uh, I kind of missed that weather prediction. I assumed it was going to be cool by now, but uh, it's 113 a day. We're going to have another week of hot weather. And then it's going to start cooling down. Our women's seminar is next month. There's going to be a lot of people coming in from out of town. And I hope it's cooler. All right. Got a nice Bible study for you tonight. Glad to be back. All right, let's have a lot of fun together while we do the announcements. And the next seminar is September 27th, as you know. See it right there. All of my teachings and the other people that teach here, they're all on YouTube, youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. We store them there. So like a 400 of them. If you'd like to help out our ministry, you can switch over from Google to Good Search and put in our charity name, and then they'll pay, pay us while you uh, surf the internet. Uh, please order one of these lists. This is the most important thing in the world. It's a step-by-step -step guide to healing and deliverance. It works 100% of the time if the person will do it. If they won't do it, uh, they don't. almost 100% of them don't get healed or delivered. Okay? Uh, it's one for mentally ill Christians, one for troubled Christians. Send it right out to you. And I'll send it tonight if you ask for it. <clears throat> Mike at HardcoreChristianity.com There's my deliverance training course. Please pray about it before you order it. Not everybody uh, is going to be happy in the deliverance ministry. This isn't for everybody. <laughs> you got to have a certain personality type to do this kind of work. You got to have the patience of Job. People are tough. Not you people. No offense. <clears throat> Want to find out what's going on in the world today? There it is. It's in the bookstore. Seven churches, Revelation. All this stuff was predicted before time. And you can don't, don't, uh, do, download our app on your phone if you want to help out with the ministry. Thank you. Don't forget about our prayer meeting here in the main sanctuary. It's the fourth Saturday of every month at 11 o'clock. And then at noon on the same day, we have our uh, deliverance training class. That's in the small sanctuary. Fourth Saturday of every month at noon. The donation boxes are on the doors. Thank you for helping us, particularly now with the utility bills. They're really high during the summer. You can donate on the website and on our PayPal button. That's where we get most of our donations. <clears throat> I've been on the radio for 21 years, right here, 1010 AM Christian Radio. I'm on every morning while you're driving to work. If you're unemployed, you'll have to remember, <laughs> you must have a radio at home. Please get a job. As you drive to work, I'll see you at 7.30 every morning and on Saturday and Sunday afternoons. Yeah. The radio program is completely different from what I do on Friday nights. Those programs are, man, they're filthy. And uh, I deal with some very nasty topics. Different, different, <laughs> I have a different audience on the radio than I do here. I tone it down for y'all. I got a podcast I toned down tremendously on Sunday mornings, twitch.tv. You can, we can spend our Sunday mornings together at 9 o'clock. I hope you'll, hope you'll join me. Send me an email. I'll give you the uh, information to log on. YouTubers, I tell you this every time I'm down here. Set up your ambush team in your church. You need two or three people. I'm using this clicker now. There it is. Two or three people. Can you see that? Oh, man. There it is. 
Well, sometimes it works. Wow. All you, got, all you need is two or three people, and you can start mopping the church up. You pick them off one at a time. This person gets healed. Then they tell somebody. Then that person comes in. Then they tell. Pretty soon it just spreads. I've done it before. I know it works. Brother Rick kills this thing on Wednesdays, the Zoom service. Man, this thing is powerful. Stephanie's on there. She's a, she's a beast. Tremendous anointing on that. Don't miss that Wednesday night Zoom, please, for crying out loud. It's impressive. I, I wrote three books. They're all in the bookstore. One on the mentally ill Christians, one on healing, and one on Satan. And Julie is teaching on Tuesday nights on that book I just mentioned. How do Christians get healed of mentally Ill mental illness? My book, Plan of Spirit, she goes through it step by step. Men and women in the class. Okay. If you're mentally ill, go ahead and show up. Julie may need you for a prop. Okay, so, no. I, I retract that. Kelly will cut that. <laughs> All right, don't forget about Saturday night. Brother Mike, he's, he's, he's turning into a monster around here. He's really doing great. So is his wife. She does the children's deliverance service, which is tomorrow, by the way. That thing is fantastic. Saturday night, 6 o'clock. There it is. Tomorrow, right here in the small sanctuary. Pre-teens only, bring your kid in. It's fantastic seeing children deliver. It's really heartwarming. Tomorrow morning at 10. Thank you. We're broadcasting on these platforms, YouTube and Rumble. If I say something inappropriate, uh, sometimes we take down the YouTube one, but we leave it up on Rumble. Yeah. That's how it works. And then we rebroadcast them <laughs> later on. Whenever Kelly puts them up, I'm not sure when it is. But anyway, these three are killing it. So, <laughs> And we're also on, on odyssey.com. That's our new one. All of our stuff's getting posted there, I think. All right. God's minorities. Got a nice Bible study for you tonight. But before I do it, will you help me pray for these people? Only take a second. Uh, we get these uh, sex pervert announcements. They come in the mail. Uh, these people get out of jail and then they move into the neighborhood. Here's Andre Davis. And I'm not going to give you the address. Here's Brian Rose. And uh, here's uh, Jack Munoz. Yeah. These guys all got demons. The demons uh, told them to molest somebody or rape somebody or something. I know what they did. And they can all be forgiven, healed, and delivered. All of them. Every one of them. In fact, these uh, perverts, rapists, and child molesters, they make good preachers. Why is that? Well, because... He that forgive, is forgiven much, loves much. He that forgives is forgiven little, loves a little. And that's the state of most Christians in the United States. They don't sense they've been forgiven very much, so they don't love very much. They can kind of take it or leave it. These kind of people that get forgiven and healed, wow, they're on fire for God. They love him. They don't come to church and just sit there. These kind of people. They're God, God chasers. God seekers. Perverts. I'd like to hold a revival for a bunch of perverts. I'd like to fill this, I'd like to fill this entire room full of rotten sex perverts. I'd be in hog heaven. Love having the sex perverts around. It's heartwarming. Because I know the Holy Ghost is looking for him. He that is forgiven much, loves much. 
you get those people saved, they're not like regular Christians. They kill it. Lord God, I just uh, mentioned these three guys here. I know the demons took them. I know what happened to them. And I know that you can help them, save them, and heal them. I'm lifting them up right now. I'm asking you to hunt these guys down. I didn't mention the addresses. You know where they are. I want you to go get them. I want you to save them, and I want you to deliver them from demons. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Uh, in our society, there, there's a big thing on minorities. Are you black? Are you white? Are you brown? Are you red? Are you yellow? Are you whatever? Minorities, are, boy, that's a big deal now. You mention somebody's race, and everybody starts freaking out. But what people don't realize is that Christians are, are not really a minority, but disciples are. Christians are a dime a dozen. Most of them are virtually useless. Disciples are extremely dangerous people to Satan. The devil's got Christians in the bag. They're no threat to him whatsoever. Disciples bother him. A disciple will give him a hemorrhoid. He don't like disciples. Christians, no problem. They're in the bag. If you want to be a disciple, you got to remember something. You're going to be in the minority for the rest of your life. Matthew 7, enter at the straight gate, King James Version. Stay in us, narrow gate. Enter the narrow gate. Wide is the gate, and broad is the hadas road. Broad is the road that leads to destruction many go there this verse will shock you tonight it was misinterpreted excuse me mistranslated in the King James Bible I'm going to give you the real translation right now straight is the gate and narrow is the way oops ruined the verse flebo means crowded <clears throat> the road to hell is a huge road. The road to heaven is a huge road. But the gate is small. The gate to hell is huge. This verse should never have been translated with that word narrow. It ruined the meaning of it. Few find it. Here's what the verse actually says. Both roads are huge. The wide road to hell is big. The gate is big. The road to heaven is huge. But the gate is small. What's the real interpretation of that verse? It's not what you've heard. It's not what you thought. You've got to fight. To get through the small gate if you're a Christian. You don't just walk in. Wow. Luke 14, whoever does not bear, bastadzo means to haul a heavy load, carry around a heavy load. Something in your life is heavy and you have to carry it around for a while. If you will not bear your cross and come after the Lord, you've got to do two things. You cannot be my disciple. Translation, you can't get through that narrow gate. You're on the road to go to the gate, and it's crowded. But to get through the gate? Mm -mm. Unless you can bear a heavy load, you cannot be... A Christian? That's not what it says. The Greek word is Christianos. That's a Christian, a person who believes in Christ. A disciple is a true follower of Christ, an imitator of Christ. Unless you can tough it out and get through the narrow gate when it's crowded, you can't become a disciple. 
Oh, Brother Mike, that's, this is bad news. Where's the peace, love, happiness, and all the joy? We'll get to that in a minute. Which of you intending to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost, whether you've got the resources to finish it? Well, nobody, nobody does that. What's he saying there? Why is Christianity suck so bad in this country? Why are there so many weak Christians? Why are so many losers out there? Nobody counted the cost. Why didn't they count the cost? Well, they had gutless, useless preachers who preached a happy-go-lucky, peace, love, happiness, and joy message. So everybody came down. Of course, I want happiness, peace, and joy. I got to come to Christ to get happiness, peace, and joy. I want to be joyful and happy, so I want to receive Christ. And the preachers lied. They didn't tell them the whole story. If you tell somebody only half the story, you're at fault, not the person that hears it. Preachers get judged more heavily at Judgment Day, did you know that, than regular Christians do. Preachers get more responsibility heaped on them. If you want to be in the ministry, I might be in the ministry, Mike. You do. Well, you better count the cost before you go in the ministry. You're going to have to bear a heavy load, and you're going to get on the same road everybody else is on. Man, it's crowded with Christians out there. But when you get down to the end, you're going to have to fight to get in because the door is narrow. This is, Christianity is like, like the state of Arizona, you know, and they tell you about the lottery. Run a big ad on TV. Oh, look. Look at this guy. He's a total loser. He won the lottery. Look, if it can happen to this moron, it can happen to you. Oh, they got a beautiful ad on TV. Everybody's happy. Oh, this guy who's flat broke buzzing around in a new boat, Lake Mead. You can win the lottery. It's all marketing. It's the same phony preachers doing exactly the same thing. Hey, when you come to Christ, it's going to be great. You're going to get saved and you'll be so happy. Oh, it's going to be fun. Fun with Jesus. The Bible says just the opposite. It's a lottery pitch. It's all lies. You're going to have to count the cost to come in. You're going to sit down and say, whoa, what do I got to give up? What do I got to change? Who do I got to get rid of? What do I got to start, start doing? What do I got to stop reading? What do I got to stop reading? Who do I got to stop hanging around? What do I got to stop saying? What do I got to stop doing? Where do I got to start going? What do I need to stop going? You got to count the cost to be a disciple. If you're a Christian, you don't. You just get on the wide road, big road. Everybody's on there. Not everybody gets in. So Jesus uh, emphasizes it again. He says, beware of false prophets. They're like people in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, our pucks. They're greedy, hoarding, self-absorbed, self-centered wolves. But on the outside, they look great. They sound great. They sound like a TV preacher. Great looking suit, hot personality, great choir. They got a big old Christian rock band up there. It's all a hoax. Where do you get that stuff, Mike? Well, I get it because I can read. You got to count the cost, folks, before you come to Christ. Well, I'd like to be in the ministry. You wouldn't believe how many people. This happens all the time. People come to see me or someone on the staff. They start going through deliverance, and they start feeling better. Well, naturally, they feel better. They got, you know, like a rack of demons out of them. They kind of start renewing their mind. And then the demons counterattack. <clears throat> And they do it brilliantly. They go, hey, you're doing great. You got all these demons out you. You feel much better, don't you? Yeah. 
you feel freer don't you yeah you know what you ought to be in the ministry yeah you ought to be a minister wow I hadn't thought of that well you did now I just put that thought in your head oh thank you spirit yeah I'm gonna be a, I need to be a teacher I need to start testifying I need to start going to street preaching I need to yes you need to do all that you a good boy it's a setup they come to me and say should I go to the ministry and do this and I said well you know what hold on a minute I think you should do that but why don't you take a little more time and kind of finish up this project first before you go to that project but brother Mike I, I got a call a guy in my life I want to be a singer. Okay, well, that's good. good. Hold on. Hold on now. That's good. Go. You can be a singer, and that's great. God wants you to be a singer. But, but why don't we just temporarily, that's how I'd say I use temporary a lot. Yeah, I use that term. Why don't we temporarily slow that down? You know, you've got to kind of finish your deliverance. We need a little bit more mind renewal here before we jump into the ministry. What percent? Listen to me. Ah, five, ten. What happens next? Boom! The devil chops him down. He builds him up, then he cuts him down. He builds him up. Oh, I'm doing great. Boom! He chops him. He builds him up. Boom! The money goes. He builds them up. Boom! The church people turn on them. Where do you get this information, Mike? With my own eyes, seeing it actually happen for 20 years. Other than that, I don't know anything about it. Oh, come on. Really? Okay. <clears throat> years ago, back in the late 80s, Todd Bentley from Canada was a heroin addict and some street preacher got a hold of him, church got a hold of him, and the guy got saved and he had a fantastic salvation and it was incredible. And there was some deliverance people up in Canada and they were blowing demons like pterodactyls out of this guy. He went through a spectacular Deliverance. Hey, Todd, you're doing great on your deliverance. You love the Lord, don't you? I sure do. You know what? You ought to be in the ministry. Yeah. What I just told you happened, happened to poor Todd. There wasn't anybody there to say, Todd, you're doing a great job, but look, man, you were a heroin addict for 10 years. You've got demons like crazy. You know, we need, let's, let's take temporary. You know, he needs somebody that knew the word temporary. See, I know the words, so I use it and I get away with it. Take a time out here and let's finish this deliverance before you get into the ministry. He had nobody to tell him. No one helped him. What happened to him? Anybody you know that story? Well, I boomed. His ministry went from here to here. He became the number one prophetic in the United States. He was the number one minister in the prophetic movement in America. Number one guy. He was the apostle of the whole movement. How'd that happen? Well, here's how it works. 
if I'm a demon, I'm beating the crap out of you, boom, boom, and I stop doing it, you feel a lot better. And then if a minister comes along and goes, well, that's God delivered you. You're, you're doing great. You're do, you got the anointing. You're fantastic. You're going to start, oh my gosh, I'm going to the ministry. So the demon simply backed off of him. Phew. His popularity went nationwide. Everybody knew who Todd Bentley was. Everybody. Why did demons do that? Were they stupid? Wow. Maybe they were thinking of something about something. What were they thinking about? Okay, let's back off this guy. We won't beat the crap out of him anymore. And besides that, he unloaded a bunch of our compadres already. Let's let him go to the top, and then we'll cut him down. You don't know the story of Todd Bentley. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, take a look at it. You'll know exactly what I just said. It was a setup. Why? Nobody knew this word temporarily. Let's just hold on a minute. Whoa, don't, not, don't quit it permanently. I'm just said temporarily. Let's finish this up before we go to that. What do you miss? What do you miss? Thanks for asking. You didn't count the cost. Here it is, Ephesians chapter 6. Everybody has read these verses. This will come easy for you. Panoplia. Take on the whole armor of God. What is that? That's everything. Put the whole thing on. Paul was using uh, military terminology, Roman military terminology, in this section of the text in Ephesians 6, wasn't he? And this is the panoply. He's got everything here. He's got the shield, sword, armor, hat. Hear that anointing? Shin, shins, feet, everything. The Romans required you to have everything on, all of it, to go into battle. You couldn't just you couldn't put half of it on and go. Correct? <clears throat> That's true today in the United States military. You're supposed to put everything on, every piece of equipment, all the artillery, all the military equipment, all of it had to be there, all the stuff on you, all the high-tech equipment. Every one of them soldiers is like has got something like a million dollars of equipment on them. All of them. That way, when you decide to give up and pull out, you just leave all that stuff there for the country that you were working with. See, that's how that works. But anyway, that's a different topic. You've got to take the full armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil that you may be able to withstand and feast to me in the evil day. Wow, that's not, that's not peace, happiness, love, and abundant life. No, it isn't. It's actually discipleship. If you decide to become a disciple, there's a war waiting for you. If you're a Christian on the wide road, headed toward the narrow gate, there's no war. It's all crowded out here. It's a blue light special at Kmart in 1988. You're headed for the desk, but nobody gets, only one person gets the thing. Having done all, God or dead's mine, have accomplished everything to stand. Histamine. Here's what it is. And theistomy means you've got to know how to fight your way through the wide road to fight your way through the gate. And when you fight your way through, you then, histamine, you stand in victory. 
That's what Paul's talking about there. You got to be able to fight. And when you're done fighting, you stand victorious. See that? So you may be able to fight your way through in the evil day, having done, accomplished everything, and now you're standing in victory. Well, it sounds like you got to fight, Brother Mike. Yes, thank you. This is a war, and you've got to count the cost before you put on the equipment. When I got out of high school, back, uh, some of, most of you weren't born yet, but when I got out of high school, we had uh, Vietnam back then. And uh, when I got out of high school, it didn't look like uh, a lot of the young men were going to go because at that time they were starting to wind down. Vietnam, but some people didn't take it wouldn't going to take a chance on it So a lot of people went to Canada, but if you were a full-time college student Your 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 draft number dropped See When I got out So what did I do? What would you expect someone like me with a huge IQ to do? Well, I suddenly, miraculously, became a full-time college student because homie, homie don't do Vietnam. Homie don't do that. Well, I wasn't going to put the... I was going to bolt. I'm not going. I'm going to have nothing to do with Vietnam. I watch the news. <clears throat> Watch what this is saying. Hey, you got to put on the whole armor, not part of it, not some of it. See, everybody's on the wide road going to heaven. It's all crowded out there with a bunch of Christians running around. Most of them are useless. But to get through the gate, the gate drops like that. Yeah. Black Monday looks like the gate to heaven. It sure does. Everybody is standing outside Walmart on Black Monday. All the doors are locked. The small staff they've got left at Walmart. There's a skeleton crew over there now. They're all standing there shaking their boots, looking out of the glass. They, they draw straws. Some unlucky sap gets to unlock the door. The other few Walmart employees, all the greeters are hiding in the back. They're all in their 70s, my age. Somebody's got to open the door to the gates of hell. It opens and boom, a mad rush. You can't conceive or believe. People are bolting through the door and there's an obesity epidemic in America now. So bolting through doors now is a lot different than it was in the 1950s. You could bolt through the door and get in that door in the 1950s. Now, now you got to push your way in. This guy weighs 280. This gal's 240. Boom, they come in. Some of them fall. Somebody's got their phone filming it. And people are falling and getting trampled on Black Monday. I'm not making this up. That's heaven at the end. All the Christians are out there. Now they're trying to get in and they can't get in. Why not? Well, they didn't count the cost. The disciples just walked right through. They got right in. They counted the cost. I said, hey, if I'm going to become a disciple, I'm going to have to make some choices here. Some of them are unpleasant. I might have to do some fasting. Oh, that sucks. I might have to start studying the word on a regular basis. Ouch! I might have to 
get rid of some of my rotten friends. I might have to change my attitude. I might have to renew my mind. I might have to change as a person. I might have to count the cost on this thing to be able to fight my way through. Then I got to put on part of it? No, the full armor of God. I got to be able to fight my way through. When I'm done, I stand in victory. Christians can't do that. They collapse. They fall apart. They backslide. They go back to drugs. They relapse. Whatever they do, they can't do it. Why? They never put on the full. They never counted the cost. They never made the sacrifices they had to make to be a disciple. They believe the kook on TV, hosing you down for your estate and your donations. A bunch of liars, a bunch of crooks, a bunch of frauds! Wide is the gate, but narrow doors like that. Can't get in. Stand there for histony. Stand in victory. Having what? Wow. Phew. Truth. Yes. Some guy posts a question on one of these deliverance uh, Facebook pages. Forgot the name of the group. Deliverance something, whatever it was. The guy puts on there. Oh, what what kind of demons are Jezebel spirits? I made a mistake of answering it. I said, listen, who cares what kind of spirits Jezebel? What you need to focus on is your own personal life and your own personal sin. I th that went over like a lead balloon. Kaboom. I quickly ran, deleted that. Wow, everybody hates Brother Mike. Listen, people don't like to hear the truth unless you're a disciple. They gobble it up. Christians don't. What? I don't believe that. What are you talking about? Glory clouds aren't real? <laughs> you need a glory cloud you like you need another hole in your head. What you need to do is find a place here Repent of your personal sin. You got attitude problem. You got a negative thinking pattern. You take offenses. What kind of spirits are, are Ahab spirits? What kind of demons are those? Who, who gives a crap what kind of demons they are? Come down here. You yelling at your kids. Come down here. You yelling at your mother. We need to stop that. Why don't we stop that first? Let's just temporarily feel the anointing. Truth is what nobody wants to hear anymore. Truth. They can't stand it. It's a cancel culture. If you, if you, po if you post something on Facebook that's 1,000% true, you get a note from somebody in the abyss of the internet saying that you violated our community standards. How do you know about that? I got one. The breastplate of what? Oh no, you mean I don't have greasy grace? I can't just live here and there, here and there? No, you gotta count the cost, Jack. No offense if your name's Jack. You got to count the cost. What am I going to have to give up? What if you just want to be on the wide road with all the crowded with Christians? That's your business. I'm talking to people tonight who are interested in becoming a disciple. That's different than a Christian. Truth and righteousness, you're kidding. Stop it. Listen, you got to study, man, to show yourself approved unto God. You got to be able to get prepared. 
and spread the gospel. You can't just wake up on Tuesday and go, hey, I'm going to go preach. Oh, boy. You're going to get slaughtered. You can, you, you're not going to believe how many people suddenly don't like you. You're not going to believe it. You thought everybody at church thought you were okay. Not going to happen. Evangelion, what is that? Glorious good news. The gospel of God is good news. But if you preach truth and righteousness, somebody's going to come looking for you. The devil doesn't care about Christians. He worries about disciples. Above all, well, this is at the top. Because you're a warrior, right? He's talking about warriors here. The full armor of God. Armor is for fighting. Above all, take, take, pistis, the shield of faith, so you can, so you can quench belas. All these fiery darts, where does that come from? Could come from anywhere. What is it? Could be anything. A physical illness, a, a sickness, negative thoughts, lies, fabrications, stupid thoughts, religious thoughts. It could be anything. Phew. Fiery darts. How are you going to stop all that? Well, Above all, you got to have what? <coughs> the shield of faith. What's, it, what's Paul talking about here? Well, he took it out of the Roman army again. The Romans were the number one army in the world, the greatest civilization in the history of the world at that time. Their military was the number one killer in the world. And when they came to your country to slaughter you and kill everybody, they would slaughter the villages, they would take the kids, they would throw the kids up, and they'd put the spear under the kid so the kid would come down and land on the spear. Then they'd chuck that kid off. And then they'd grab another kid and throw that kid up. Then they'd move the spear over and spear that kid. Then they would cut open the pregnant women, boom, like that, in the wombs, guts, baby would fall. Romans were brutal. They were vicious. They were killers, but before they slaughtered your family and your village, you know what they would do to it first? Burn it down. How do they do that? The archers were the first assault of the Roman military. <coughs> they would stand outside the village, and the sky would light up. Burning arrows. Everything was burned to the ground. That's what Paul's talking about here. Fiery darts. <coughs> Excuse me. Belas. Fiery spears. Darts. The wicked one. He's talking about spiritual things now. Not literal darts. He's using illustration, right? And that's what the Romans looked like. They just hose you down. And then they'd come in and slaughter everybody. And they almost always won. Then you got to do what? Take the helmet of salvation. What does that mean? Hey, you got to renew your mind on the Word of God. What? You mean I can't just run out and preach with my enthusiasm, my love, and my excitement? No! Come on, man. <coughs> you got to be trained to be a warrior. You got to go through boot camp. What's boot camp? Adversity. Yeah. They go through boot camp, right? Then you got to go through another boot camp if you want to be a be a Green Beret or a Navy SEAL or something, right? And another boot camp to go through. That one's much worse than the other one. Christians don't want boot camps. They want happiness, peace, and joy. They want a comfy, loving life of Christ. Hallelujah. Keiku Jesus. That's what a Christian wants. I'm not talking to Christians right now. YouTubers, I'm looking for you. Are you listening to me? I hope you are. We're looking for disciples tonight. Disciples have to count the cost. They got to make sacrifices. Yikes. Sacrifice? Are you crazy? 
Yes, I am. You got to renew your mind. This is spiritual. You put the helmet of salvation on your head. The head, the mind is under the helmet. The mind. You got to renew your mind. You got to become, become familiar with the Word of God. Use that as your weapon. You must learn to pray always with all prayer and supplication. In the Spirit. Why do you say in the Spirit? Because you can't pray all the time. In, in English or Spanish or something. Nobody can do that. You got to be able to talk to somebody. But you can, off and on, all day long, pray in glossa, tongues. That's what Paul was talking about, praying in the Spirit. People who learn to do that see their anointing go click, 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 click. Takes a little while, but it clicks up. Watching. A grunel means you got to stay awake and stay alert with all perseverance and praying for the other soldiers who are fighting. See that? <clears throat> you got to support the other soldiers. And there it is. How many Christians do this? Virtually none. Almost none. Some lady came to see me this week, and she was in bad shape emotionally and spiritually, but she said she had been filled with the Spirit 11 years ago. She spoke in tongues and everything, but she hasn't spoken in tongues since then. And I'm going to shorten the story up after I was done working with her, and then I brought her in here, and then I had her start marching. You know, like a warrior, you march like that, you know. And I said, all right, now start speaking in tongues like you did 11 years ago. Lord bless her. Broop, cranked right out. <laughs> she was amazed. I wasn't. I <clears> wasn't. <throat> If God gives you a gift, doesn't matter what it is, and you neglect it and let it dry up, the gift's still in there. It's still in your spirit, man. It's kind of like hibernating, in a way. It's hibernating. But if you stimulate it, you can get it to pop back up. Any gift. So you went around here for 15 minutes. Singing in tongues. And hadn't done it in 11 years. This week, just happening this week. <clears throat> Christians don't do any of this stuff. Do they pray for their fellow? So no, a Christian doesn't do that. They're barely praying for themselves. Gosh, they're struggling through to pray for themselves. Do they uh, use their war tongues for battle? No, no. They're, they're getting in fights with Baptists about whether or not there are any tongues. They're going to fight over it. <laughs> Good Lord. Using the sword of the Word of God to fight? Well, I thought it was just to bless me. No, it says there, the sword of the Spirit. It's a, it's a weapon. Not to hurt people, to crush the devil's power. It's a fight. Now, some of you aren't in the mood to fight tonight, but I'm going to try and jack you up a bit. I'll do my best. That's my job. Do Christians use their shield of faith? Are you kidding me? Their faith falls apart all the time. You're kidding me. Will you pray for me? I'm the, half of them prayer requests on that prayer line to Billy Graham's outfit or any other prayer. Half of them are prayer requests that the person should have been knocking off easy. Slam dunks. Why? Their pistis is contaminated. Doesn't work anymore. 
Can it be restored? Well, I saw it restored with this gal I just told you about within 120 seconds. Well, how's that work, Brother Mike? You must be a great counselor. You know, the Holy Ghost moved, and that's what kind of power he has. He can do something in a few seconds that can't be done in 11 years. He's loaded with benefits and power. A couple of you aren't backslid. I heard you. you said amen. Prepare the gospel. Are you? Come on, man. We're not going to be doing that. We're too busy. Righteousness. Hey, I'm doing my best. Wow. Can't you see the difference? You got a disciple, you got a Christian. These people counted the cost. They sat down and counted it up. What am I going to have to sacrifice here? You mean I got to forgive him? Him? You're kidding. I hate that mother. Boop. Whoa, hold on. Temporarily, st stop cursing the person that stabbed you in the back and let's work on forgiving the person supernaturally. Just like that gal got her gift of tongues back after 11 years. You've hated somebody for 11 years. That can be restored in seconds. Why? Because I'm a good counselor? No. The Holy Ghost has all the power. Now, does he need a vessel? Yeah, you know, I told the girl, you know, I drug her into the sanctuary here. I told her to stand there. Okay. So, God needs some vessel. To do some grunt work. So I grunted her over here, then I grunted her there, then I told her to start doing that, then I followed her to make sure she was doing it. And she obeyed, and boom, the Spirit of God moved. <clears throat> yeah. It's a privilege to be a grunt worker for Him, it's a privilege to see what He does. I, I, I'm like Lou Gehrig. I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I get to see the Spirit of God move. Wow. I've hit the lottery. Yeah, I just send that into the state of Arizona. Straighten them out. Christians won't do that. They're not going to count any costs. They're not going to sacrifice. This requires sacrifice, man. You got to put some time in to study. It takes time. You got to sit down and focus on forgiving somebody. You can't just say, I forgive you. <laughs> you ignorant fool. This has to be real. You have to really forgive them. Are you kidding me? I'm not coming here anymore. Okay, well, if you go, go to the Lutherans, they'll, they'll tell you what you want. But if you're going to come here, i got to tell you what God wants, period. If you, well, I don't like you. I don't care. At my age, I don't care what you think. When I was younger, I did. Like a fool. Loins of truth. You've got, you've got to tell people the truth. Oh, my gosh, don't get mad at me. I'll get canceled. Okay. Well, those things happen. You got to count the cost. When you post something on Facebook, before you click that thing, you got to think: Is this going to get me a community standards notice? You got to think about it. You got to count the cost on your Facebook post. You got to count the cost. If you want to go from being a Christian to a disciple, you got to count it up. Do you have enough resources to finish the project? If you don't finish it, everybody will laugh at you. Look at that failure. Look at that loser. They relapsed. They backslid. Look at that. He couldn't finish the house.
You're going to be a minority if you decide to be a disciple. You're going to be in the small group. What small group? The one that gets through the narrow gate. They're on the broad road, but only they get through the narrow one. Wow. They screen you out. It's not like the New York subway. You know, if you're athletic, it's no problem. You come up to the subway, you don't pay a ticket. Oh, you skate over it. You high jump over it. You go in for free. Nobody pays anymore. At, in this gate to go to heaven? No. So they're going to they're gonna check your ticket. Because everybody wants to get in. They're pounding to get in, but they can't. The, the door's only that, that wide. It's Walmart. The doors are only so wide. There's 1,200 people in the parking lot, and there's, there's, only, there's only eight doors. Some Walmart managers will send an elderly person to open the doors. <laughs> They're figuring, hey, a part-time greeter is easier to replace. He's going to get trampled. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the old days, in the Western era, that was a few years before I was born, cattle, cattle men who were herding their giant, uh, taking all the cattle to market. And they had to herd them for miles. When they came to streams, if there was piranha in the streams, the cattle uh, owners would take <clears throat> a disabled yak or something, an older cow that wasn't in good shape, it looked like garbage, and they would shove the cow into the water here. And when the piranhas started to take that cow, they would herd the other livestock down, downstream. They would cross the water and get away from them. <clears throat> That's what they do at Walmart. Send the greeter up. Open the door, Dave. <sighs> Try to run, buddy. Another worker's comp case. Christians have to count the cost to go down this list in Ephesians 6. And if you don't count it, you're not going to make it. You cannot become a disciple. You have to stay a Christian the rest of your life. Ugh. What's the problem with being a Christian, Mike? Isn't that a good thing? No, it's not. Christians don't find their destiny. They don't fulfill their call from God. They don't see the supernatural movings of the Spirit because they won't make any sacrifices for truth and righteousness, they won't do it. They live a compromising Christian life. They're good for a while, but oh, somebody ticked them off, and man, that biatch is on my radar. And suddenly they lose their temper, suddenly they take an offense, suddenly they get pissed. And they don't stop it, they won't change. And they miss their destiny, their call in life, they waste their golden years. Some of them miraculously do it when they get older. But that's not the time you want to do it. You want to do it when you're young and you're strong and you have many good years ahead of you. You don't want to wait till you're my age. You've wasted your life. All right, well, enough of that then. When you become a disciple, friend, you become a minority. You're in the minority, and this is what's going to happen to you. The greatest Christian that ever lived <clears throat> was the Apostle Paul. And that will be true until the middle of the tribulation when what happens? The two witnesses show up. They're the two most powerful, two greatest Christians that ever lived. But until that time, Paul was number one, still number one to this day. Paul did everything he had in uh, Ephesians chapter check. He personally did it. Ephesians 6, Paul had all the gifts of the Spirit, all nine gifts of the Spirit. 
This guy was a spiritual monster. He could come into town by himself and spark a monumental revival. He'd walk down the street and his shadow would fall on these totally disabled, ruined, diseased, dying humans. He would get up one after the other. Why? He counted the cost. He made the sacrifice. He did Ephesians 6. What happened to him when he did it? What's going to happen to you, some of you, when you do it? You got to count the cost. What cost? This cost. 2 Timothy 4. Wow. Demas forsook me. He loved the present age. And he left me. He abandoned me. Hey, listen. Come on now. You got to be brave to count the cost. You got to. Be brave to make sacrifices to become a disciple. You can't just suddenly wake up, oh, I'm a disciple. I'm fine. You got to make some sacrifices. And guess what, guess what could happen to you? People you thought loved you and cared for you, people you thought were supporting you, will turn on you in a heartbeat. Are you sure that's going to happen? Well, it happened to the number one Christian that ever lived. It's going to happen to me. Come on. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. 2 Timothy 4. The Lord reward him according to his works. You guys need to be aware of this guy. Watch out, he's coming to your church. <clears throat> I, did a, I did that on Facebook one time. Man, I got in trouble. Some guy I knew had already gone over to another church. I knew the guy was loaded with demons. I knew what he was going to do over there. So I warned him. I said, hey, this, there's going to be a lot of discord, splits, fighting over doctrine. You know, the only fighting that happened was people fighting me. Well, I got in trouble. He's telling them, hey, watch out for this guy. He's a, he's a church splitter. And these to me, he resisted everything we said. He fought us tooth and toenail. Hey, that's going to happen to you. If it happened to him, it could happen to you. you got to count the cost. Why am I sharing this with you? These are the kind of things you got to count. These are some of the costs you got to count. Somebody may betray you. Someone you thought supported you may turn on you. People who said they would help you may not help you. <clears throat> At my first answer, nobody stood with me. Everybody bagged me. And I pray God they not just not be laid to their charge. But he said, the Lord stood with me and he strengthened. That's going to happen to you. If you count the cost and decide to become a disciple and not a Christian anymore, hey, people might leave you. The Lord will not leave you. Thus saith the Lord, I, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Matthew. Everybody might bag you, not the Holy Ghost. He's going to stay right there with you. This woman that I was telling you about, unbelievable, lived a life of sin you wouldn't even believe. This was after she was saved and filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> Sinning like crazy. What happened to her? Well, I drug her out of there, brought her over here. And I told her, march over there. And I followed her to make sure she did. And then the Holy Ghost, boom, jumped on her. Eleven years of rotten sinning. Forgiven in an instant. She repented and asked God to forgive her. Boom, it happened just like that. Right? That, that's what the blood does. Huh? <clears throat> Come on now. You got the blood on your side. You can't lose. That poor woman had no business being healed. None at all. Grace turns stuff that's no, but nobody's business into God's business. Everybody bagged me, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Yeah. Yeah, it's painful to have people bag you. You know, I've had several people in this ministry 
bag me over the years. Get mad at me, go on out there, bad mouth me all over the place. Somebody leaves me and bags me and leaves, I just bring in a new bag. No offense. Listen, people are going to bag you, but God's going to strengthen you. It says it right there. If it says it there, that means it's true. That by me the preaching might be fully known to all the, the Gentiles. Ethnos is a Greek word. It means nations. To all the nations, they heard the gospel. Even though these people bagged me, this guy left me, this guy forsook me, God didn't forsake me, and I was able to get the message out and fulfill my destiny. I got delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Hey, there's a lion stalking you. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. Second Timothy 4 again, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me to the heavenly kingdom. The road's wide with a bunch of Christians running around on it like fire ants, but the hole to get into the hive, little one, little hole. Paul got through. The Christians don't get through. Why? They never counted the cost. They didn't make the sacrifices. They didn't change their minds, their attitudes, their behaviors. They didn't repent of their sins. They didn't stop. They didn't start. They didn't quit. They didn't begin. They just kind of sat there. You know what happens a lot? This happened several hundred times over the years. No, I'm telling you the truth here. I get calls a lot of people telling me, you know what? Man, I got a disaster in my life. My mother, my dad, my brother, my sister, my wife, my kids, my job, my finance, whatever it is, could be anything. And while they're telling me about this disaster, I'm listening and I'm praising the Lord. <laughs> I don't let them know it. I keep it a secret. Okay? I got a lot of secrets. I'm praising God because some people will not turn to God unless they are beaten into it. Here's what happens. The Christians putter along with their lives and then a disaster strikes. Boom. This person gets possessed. This person has cancer. This horrible thing happens. That horrible thing happens. Then, since they don't have any spiritual warfare skills, they never went through Ephesians 6. They have to call somebody who did. So they contact everybody. Their pastor, their minister, the guy on YouTube. None of it works. And what they don't understand is that disaster that fell into their lives is actually God's mercy trying to snap themselves out of their Christianity so they will learn spiritual warfare to not only help this person but others. Some people will not turn to God unless they're in jail. Yes, yes. I used to have a jail and prison ministry, and every week I went all over the state to different prisons. I went down to Maricopa County four or five times a week. There are all the convicts sitting there. There they are. Some of them were repenting now that would have never repented out on the street. I grew to love jail. I considered it a date. It's, it's date night. I'm going to prison. Because some people will not change unless they're forced to change. And those are Christians. Disciples change willingly. They change quickly. 
Christians don't. They have to be goaded and beaten and whipped into it by the love of God. What? I've got cancer? Yeah, praise God. I hope it's a good case of it because you're going to turn your life over to God now. Had you not got the cancer, you would have never repented. You would have been running around with all the other Christians on the white road and there's a narrow door and you can't get through because you don't know how to fight. You never put on the whole armor of God. You only put a little bit of it. I got the shoes. I've been working on that. I went to Bible college. Bible college. The whole armor of God doesn't just include Bible college. What's my prayer? I pray you get caught and I pray you go to jail. <laughs> Call me when you get a chance. Issues found. Virus. Okay, great. Then Paul says, we are troubled. Flebo means pressured. Pressured? I thought he was the greatest Christian that ever lived. That's why he got pressured. <laughs> if you're a Christian, you're in the bag already. You know, <laughs> you're good. If you're going to change, yeah, somebody's going to come looking for you. Pressured on every side, but we are not. Stan Correo, we are not. They got us surrounded. Remember that? But God gave me an exit. He found a way to escape. See, I didn't end up like Custer. Custer got surrounded. Oops. Nowhere to go. Not the Holy Ghost. We were pressured and surrounded, but we were not trapped. We were perplexed. Apareo, what does that mean? Confused. <clears throat> how can you how can Paul be confused? He's a great because nobody knows everything. No one knows everything. No one's ever gonna know everything. Every born-again Christian, every disciple, every Christian is gonna have periods where things are happening to them where they don't understand. They just don't get it. They don't, nothing makes sense. It happened to Paul. It's going to happen to us. What's happening here? But. See that but there? Buts are great. Yeah. <clears throat> the Greek word is Allah. Not, not the he, not the Quran Allah, I mean, this is a conjunction in the Greek text. A but is great. Whenever you see, you, whenever you see a conjunction in, this, in the text, what does that mean? That means that uh, that doesn't work well. What it means is this part of the text is connected to that part every time you see a conjunction. And chi is a Greek word, is a conjunction, right? <clears throat> such as such as such and such as that means that this text part of the text and that text They're related relatives But we are not Except Perea, we are not despondent Okay Christians do the opposite when bad things happen to them. and They don't understand it. They start getting down in the dumps. They start getting depressed. They start getting confused. They start getting frustrated. Why isn't this working out? Why does this make any sense to me? Paul's attitude was, hey, I don't know everything, and I'm not going to understand everything. Yes, Paul and Silas were sitting in the prison that night, feces over here and urine over there in stocks, and none of that made any sense to them. Where's the providential care of God? What happened? How come we're not getting cover? Where's that covering? I better call Jesse Duplantis and get his church to cover me. 
No, no, he already knew he was, co un was covered by God, but he was in the stocks sitting with feces and urine. The whole place smelled like a toilet. And he and Silas start singing. Christians would never do that. They'd call their lawyer, they'd, they'd call their psychiatrist, they'd go into a depression. Paul f would flip it. But he didn't understand everything, and he didn't have to understand everything. That's called walking by faith, not by sight. That's what we're called to do. We weren't in despair over it. We weren't despondent over it. Hey, we're good. Those things happen. We were persecuted. Dioko means to have somebody chasing you. We were persecuted, but we were not. What? We didn't get left behind. We got away. Come on. Christians get caught all the time. <laughs> caught, trapped, and hauled off. Not a disciple. Not Ephesians 6. Doesn't happen to them. We are cast down. Katabala. What does that mean? To be viciously slammed. But we were not destroyed. We were not Apollomy. Ruined. Who's that guy? <laughs> Katabala. Andre's picking up a 300 pound guy and throwing him like a rag doll. Andre's the reason I believe in Nephilim. But anyway, <clears throat> what the Nephilim used to do in war, they would cut the people to shreds. They would pick them up and throw them like weapons. They would pick up some guy and throw him 50 feet like Andre. That's what they did to Paul. Cataballo completely smashed. Then he goes on in, in chapter 2, he goes on other people who had forsaken him. He says, what they're saying will uh, echo no me. What does that mean? <clears throat> what he's talking about there is using cattle and horses grazing as an illustration. The cow doesn't eat all the grass at once. He just gradually eats it. See, when somebody comes in with a false doctrine, they don't come in with a whole load. They come in with one little thing bad and then they kind of add a little something later. It's like grazing. They just kind of get a little in and then a little more in. That's what Paul's saying here. They're coming in with false doctrine, but they won't come in with the whole load. They'll just come in a little bit at a time. See? And it's like gangrena, which is our English word gangrene. And it means an ulcer or a tumor, so it's probably some kind of cancer. That little thing cancer starts out slow and then it kind of builds you don't just have stage four cancer on Tuesday it starts out if you're lucky you catch it the doctors try to get you in chemotherapy and all that stuff but Paul's saying this is almost like a tumor it starts out little and then it starts growing and that's what these people did that betrayed me he said they started saying little things here and there gossip here negative word there some little planted false seed and then he said <clears throat> these two guys he calls them by name they were loins guarded with guarded with what truth they tore off their belts of truth and got into doctrinal error and they started teaching people that the rapture already happened And people started to lose their faith in Christ because Paul was teaching, look, this is all future tense. The rapture, the tribulation, all that stuff, that's all down the road. The Antichrist isn't here yet. He's down there. And then the people thought, oh, my God, it happened already? Really? Oh, no, I missed everything? Now these people are down in the dumps, and they lost their faith. They thought they missed, missed the rapture. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows those that are his. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. <clears throat> 
Now, I mentioned this dozens of times before, but sinning, sinning is different than iniquity. Iniquity is what's inside of you. Sinning is the illustration of what's outside of you. Okay? So, if I came over here to this gal, and I just give her a couple of good slaps, and she's looking over to him, but he says, he's not going to do anything about it because he likes me. But I just sinned. I gave her, I got her, finally after all these years, I got her straightened out. I gave her a good slapping around. But slapping her was my sin, but the iniquity was in my heart before I slapped her. The iniquity was in here. I need to slap her. See? So my iniquity is evil. Even though I never touched her. See the difference? So Paul is saying iniquity in here. In your soul. In your mind. In your inner man. Your iniquity precedes your sinning. See? Uh, yesterday a bunch of people got shot in Georgia. Some dad knew his son was mentally ill and dangerous and let him have a gun anyway. The, guy, the kid goes to the school and starts shooting everybody. Well, they got the kid, and they got, then they arrested the dad. Did you see that? <clears throat> now these shootings, they're going after the parents. You know, thank God for that. But before the kid shot anybody, the shooting was already in there. It may not have been in the dad's dad. He may have just done something stupid, which led to it. The kid should have never had a gun. Right? So he's going to prison along with the kid. But the point I'm trying to make is, the shooting occurred long before the kid got to the school in here. I've counseled many uh, marriages over the years. And, you know, I have a good result in about 80% of them. About 20% of them, I, they tank on me. You wouldn't believe how many marriages... This, one of the spouses said to me, I couldn't believe it. I didn't see it coming. He, just, he or she just walked into the living room and said, you know, I want out of this marriage. I want, I'm leaving. In fact, probably shouldn't share this, but it happened to my sister. My, my brother-in-law walks into the kitchen and says, I'm leaving. It's over. They got divorced. My sister lives, lives alone now. Back in Kansas. But here's, here's the point. The divorce was already in here. My my uh, brother-in-law already divorced her in here before he came to the kitchen to tell her, I'm leaving. I'm done with this thing. That's what Paul's talking about. Iniquity. Iniquity. Why is he doing that? Because you cannot... Put on the full armor of God with iniquity in your soul. Come on now, you got to get that out of there. <clears throat> I've counseled sex addicts before, and you know, those are the prospects for those are poor. And here's why the porn, the porn is never the problem. The porn, porn is, is, a, is an island 
that you go to in your mind and in your soul that makes you valuable when your life sucks and it's very similar to alcohol and drugs it's an escape mechanism so this person has a rotten marriage they're not attracted to their wife anymore and in this porno world it's a fantasy world where they are these great lovers and they have these renovated genitalia and they look like Burt Reynolds in their prime and it's all in their mind then the wife finds out about it and they're crushed why are they crushed because it's adultery it's grounds for divorce if a man lusts after a woman in their heart they've committed adultery already with them they've never touched them why the iniquity starts inside the sin is the manifestation outside of the person he was already committing adultery in here first Iniquity is a killer because it precedes sin, sinning. Do you sin without iniquity? Do you suddenly wake up, oh, I'm just going to sin? No, most people have iniquity in here. That it's a process of the soul. You know, it's anger, it's frustration, it's lust, it's whatever it is. And then the behavior comes out the rage, the anger, the cursing. Oh! Well, that priest, that's a sin, the scream, the iniquity in here first. That's why he mentioned that. That's why he told all Christians listen, you've got to take stock of yourself, you've got to analyze yourself to see whether or not you be in faith. Because the iniquity is not faith. Yeah, I've been doing this for years. Maybe I need to stop it. But on my radio program, I'm always teaching the people that. When a scandal breaks out in the church, it's not a surprise. There's a process to church scandals, and it starts out with iniquity. It starts out something inside the soul of the pastor or the minister, something in there has been held back. By the person they're watching their behavior but they haven't got rid of the iniquity they're pushing it back they're burying it they're they're Bill Clinton they compartmentalize it and shelve it in their minds that's what Bill would do he would do some have this horrible evil thing and then he would shelve it and bury it and it wasn't there anymore he could put it away Well, finally, this iniquity in the pastor or whoever it is suddenly starts to manifest because of a, some kind of external trigger. Usually a person, a situation, an opportunity, something happens and this iniquity then comes out and the person commits a sin. And the people that are surrounding the minister, the close people, in the, the ones in the circuit, they know about it. But they don't tell anybody about it. The general congregation out there doesn't know anything. They know nothing. Because they're not on the ins, they're on the outs. And then, boom, 
the scandal breaks. It's usually money or sex, one of those two. And every time that happens, I have a radio program on it, and I explain to the people just kind of what I'm talking to you about. Here's how this process works, and here's how the demons work. People get these jobs as ministers, pastors, and preachers, youth ministers, and so on, but they never went through deliverance. So they carry their demons from their sinful life into their Christian life, and so now they're a pastor and a preacher, and they're not required to go through deliverance. They're only required to get a certificate at a Bible college or a seminary. Well, that's not qualification to be a minister. That's got nothing to do with it. I said, here's how it worked. This person got infected with spirits here. They went to Bible college here. They got this pastoral job here. They got that one. They got promoted to that one. Boom, now they're, now they're there. Their demons followed them all the way up the ladder. And the iniquity in here was never removed. It always comes out, comes to the surface. Sooner or later. But they beat it down for years, for months or whatever it is, and nobody knows about it. All right, well, enough of that then. All right, let's close with this. In a great house, there are only not only vessels of gold and silver, but wood and earth. Some are honorable, gold and silver. Some are dishonorable, wood and earth. Wood and earth can't, aren't going to survive. They're not going to be able to stand in the fire. If a man purge himself, he'll be a vessel to honor. If a man, per now don't you see, did you notice it doesn't say God doing it? See that? That's not God. Notice that? That shocked me when I first read it 25 years ago. If a man purge himself, he will be a vessel to honor. What's he talking about there? The road is wide with all kinds of Christians on it, but the gate they get in down there is narrow. And this is what you'd like to be in life, right here. Sanctified. I'd like to have my other pointer. Sanctified. Oh, geez. And meat for the master's use. That's what you'd like to have. That's what you would like to do. <clears throat> yeah. That's what you want. Prepared to do all kinds of different work. That's what you'd like to do. I just want, I don't want to do one thing for God. I like to do other things for God. All right. That sounds great. Without raising your hands, though, which of you here are more earthy or woody? Which of you are more like silver and gold? Anybody know? Well, in order to be silver and gold, you had to have done this. Ephesians 6. If you haven't done it, the probability is you're going to be on the wide road heading to heaven. There's all kinds of people on there. But getting in down there, wow, you're going to have to fight to get in. It's a war. It's a war. Now I got news for you. The only hope your family has is you. You know what? The only hope they got is you. Why? You, they've never been exposed to spiritual warfare, have they? They don't know anything about this. They're Christians. Good as a Christian. Come on. The Bible is not set up for Christians. It's set up for disciples. It's a training manual. Well, when you get saved, that was only the initial step. Salvation is the baby step. You're here. You got to go there. What you're talking about, Willis? I'm explaining to you that getting saved was only the starting block. 
that was only the beginning of your walk. The full armor of God. No Christian has the full armor of God that just got saved. They don't even know what they're doing. They need somebody to disciple them, to help them, to train them. No. Who wants to do it? Anybody? Yeah, I'd take three people. Let's go to prayer then.